uh, a religion that we haven't heard anything about. Uh, we, uh, I think I had uh, him planned for last semester, and as I got involved in scheduling people, uh, I realized by the time I got to his name, I had filled up the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was a reason or not, but anyway, uh, that's, that's what happened. So, uh, and in fact, something similar has already happened this semester as well. I uh, have too many ideas and not enough uh, classes to do them in. But uh, we also lost a class, if you remember. I think that may have been the real reason that we lost a class because of the snowstorm last uh, semester. Uh, or was the, the hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, I think it was. Not the snowstorm, we didn't get any snow. So, uh, today we have uh, uh, Reverend Stephen, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the uh, Eastern Orthodox minister. We have Joshua Snyder, who has been at the uh, First Unitarian Church in uh, North Wilmington off Route 202, just below where the uh, YMCA is and uh, the uh, post office up on, off 202. This church is right off on the same side of the road, just south of the uh, YMCA. And uh, he's going to speak to us about the Universalist Unitarian religion. Uh, we have several members of his congregation here. I know there are many others that I've uh, run across who actually recommended him to me who are not here today as a, as a very, very good speaker. He's been with First Unitarian, he tells me, for five years and is a uh, native of uh, Michigan. So with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Reverend Snyder. Uh, oh, can you hear me all right? Okay? All right. First I want to say just uh, how honored I am to be here uh, today. Uh, as Joe said, uh, I have a number of congregants who uh, have been part of the Academy of Lifelong Learning and have raved about it and told me so many wonderful things, and so it's a pleasure for me to be able to be here today and to experience it firsthand. Uh, Unitarian Universalism is a notoriously difficult uh, religion to talk about in clear and plain English. Unitarian Universalism seems to be a religion uh, for people who like to put a lot of asterisks next to, uh, and footnotes to, uh, next to what it is that they believe. Uh, and as perhaps you will uh, come to understand by the conclusion of our time together, uh, asking the question, what is it that Unitarian Universalists believe, may very well be the wrong question to ask. Perhaps the, that characteristic alone might be the thing that makes Unitarian Universalism unique in, among the world religions. However, I don't mean to shy away from that. I will attempt to answer for you what it is that Unitarian Universalists believe, Quixotic, though that uh, challenge may prove to be. I myself am a student of world religions. It was my uh, major in my undergraduate days. Uh, so I'm very much in sympathy with uh, your project here in this class. Uh, in fact, I took some classes very similar to it back when uh, I was going to school. I thought that we might begin uh, in the beginning, uh, perhaps begin with some history to set the stage a bit for us. So I uh, ask your patience as we go back, 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 all the way back to uh, that first century, the first few centuries of the Common Era, right? Uh, as the early church is being formed. This was when Christianity was still kind of in an embryonic stage and, and uh, had not yet become the officially uh, endorsed religion of the Roman, Orthodox, of the Roman Empire. Uh, the story of Unitarian Universalism really begins in uh, the year 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, this is the first council of the church, and it gathered bishops from all over the Mediterranean uh, to settle some of the important issues that were going on within Christianity at that time. Uh, among these were trying to get a handle on the relationship between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, at that time, not everyone was 100% certain as to what that relationship was and what it understood. They hadn't achieved consensus around that. How did these three 
entities interact um, was sort of the uh, question put before the bishops. Now, when I say bishops, it's a few hundred people. It wasn't quite as elaborate as the conclave that's going on right now. Uh, but uh, so it was. It was a little bit more humble uh, uh, meeting than that. But uh, um, of course, there were to consider the gospel biographies of Jesus. Uh, you know the. You know we had stories about Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Actually, in those days, there were more stories even than those four. Uh, but these, this biography that was before the church had, had some kind of contradictory facts in it. Jesus claims to be the Son of God. What does that mean, right? That's sort of the question. Uh, does it mean that he is in some way kind of a literal descendant of the God of Israel who somehow merged with the Virgin Mary and produced a child? That could be one explanation. Actually, that's not unlike how Greek heroes like Hercules uh, were understood to have lived. Or was Jesus kind of speaking metaphorically in that moment, meaning that he's the son of God in much the same way that the Old Testament refers to the early kings of Israel, such as King David, who is referred to at various points as either the son of God or the son of man. Furthermore, how is it that, according to these stories, Jesus has sort of these supernatural powers to, to enact miracles, uh, you know, where he can bring people from the dead uh, and make them living again. Yet, in other scenes in his biography, he's very human, afraid of the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, oh, wow, he doesn't even want to be crucified at that moment, you know, right at the eve of the Passion story. Surely, if Jesus were the Son of God, such a moment of weakness would have been out of character. Well, to further complicate matters, there were true two versions about how Jesus and God, or how Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit interacted. There were kind of two competing schools of thought. I don't know if they were like Republicans and Democrats, where one sat on one side, and others sat on the other side of the aisle. But uh, one version of, of how these three entities interacted uh, was put forth by a fellow named Athanasius, who said that all three of those entities are different sides of the same being. That they're interrelated and have the same essence, uh, which is kind of a crucial idea in Greek metaphysics. And so therefore, we can understand them to be the same thing, the same being. Now contrary to that idea, was the teachings of another fellow by the name of Arius. And Arius, who's bishop uh, at the Church of Alexandria in Egypt, he taught that Jesus was not divine, but was human. Perhaps the most gifted human, the most perfect human we can, can think of, but that Jesus was a human being. Uh, now, are there any uh, comic book fans out there in the audience like me? I've got young kids, and, and so we, we read a lot of comic books together. Uh, one, one way that uh, I've uh, come to understand the difference between Athanasius and Arius is the same difference between Superman and Batman, if you will. Uh, that Superman had supernatural powers granted to him, of course, by the yellow sun of Earth. He's from another planet, yet he appears to be human, as Clark Kent. Batman, on the other hand, has no supernatural powers. He's just a person, but he's trained himself to be the world's greatest detective, the world's greatest martial artist, or whatever. whatever. Uh, he's human, but he's perfected himself, so to speak. So Superman is more than human, with special supernatural abilities and powers, but can appear to be human. Where it, and Athanasius said Jesus was more, more along those lines, more like Superman, whereas Arius's Jesus was a little bit more like Batman if we can use that metaphor, uh, uh, a human being, but perfect. I don't know if Jesus wore a utility belt or not, but uh, uh, I hope he did. The, so the Council of Nicaea, where, we were, where they were debating these two competing ideas about who Jesus was, and therefore who God is, right? That's really what we're talking about, is, is uh, to some degree who Jesus was, but, but, but to a large degree it's about who God is. Is God three, or is God one? And how do three become one? And, how did, and so this is a very, very complicated matter. And it took the intervention of the Emperor Constantine to break 
the deadlock there. Uh, and eventually Athanasius' uh, position prevailed. And those of you who may be uh, Catholic or from uh, other denominations may actually recite the creed, uh, the statement of belief that was put forth at Nicaea. It's called the Nicene Creed. Um, and uh, I believe part of the Catholic liturgy even to this day is uh, something that is said as part of the Mass. Uh, now Arius, of course, is teaching unfortunately, from his perspective, I guess, uh, was declared heretical. Um, and uh, uh, it was also, it came to be known, some, some people called it Arianism, which is, <laughs> in our modern terms, not a great thing to call it. Uh, but uh, uh, it's also sometimes known as subordinationism. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, the way Arius would describe Jesus was that he was subordinate to God. So if you think of God uh, uh, sort of up, up here, and humans are down here. Jesus is kind of somewhere in the middle, according to Arius. Um, and so being subord a subordinate being to God, uh, his position came to be known as subordinationism. Uh, Jesus is still revered. His teaching is still the center of uh, what is understood by its adherents to be a Christian faith, Christian ethics and theology. But his death and resurrection, perhaps his miracles, not emphasized as part of that, uh, that school of thought. Now note that Arianism had, or, or subordinationism, had about half of Christendom in its sway. So there's a good part of the early church that believed what became heretical. Uh, this belief kind of went underground uh, at the time, after Nicaea. Um, and instead that Nicene Creed became uh, the orthodox teaching of the Christian church. Um, and it is from that council, the Council of Nicaea, that the doctrine of the Trinity is born. Uh, and the doctrine of the Trinity, I kind of mentioned it before, is that the three persons of God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, are united, are of the same being, same essence. And I'm sure the Catholics in the room can recite the Creed better than, from memory, better than I can. But uh, that, that, that those three become three manifestations of, of the same being. Uh, which is God. As I said, Arianism goes underground. It can't be, can't show itself because it's now a heresy. Uh, and it re and sort of pops up from time to time, but really we see it reemerge at the time of the Reformation. That's the 16th century. Uh, every uh, major revolution in history, I think, is sparked by a revolution in how we communicate. So you see this with the internet these days. Uh, a couple of years ago with the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement were really uh, two political events that came about as a result of you know, the ability to use Twitter and YouTube and so forth. Uh, a quantum leap up by our ability to communicate changes how ideas spread and how uh, different uh, ideas can be born. The Age of Enlightenment brought about the, both the American and the French revolutions. And it was just prior to the Reformation of the 16th century that we have Gutenberg's printing press. And this is a really important thing because prior to that printing press being uh, uh, created, there were two ways in which you heard, there was really only one way you heard about the Bible, A, in Latin, and B, at church. Now, the Bible can be translated, it can be translated into English, the King James Bible, for example, gets translated about this time. Uh, it, you know, there, there's, time, there's times when we can hear it in a language that we understand and speak every day, and then, of course, it's read not by monks and priests, but by anybody who checks into the Motel 6, right? We can, we can, of course, they didn't have it back then, but uh, any, anywhere that, you know, anyone can have a Bible in their house now. So. Uh, which means anybody can read it. Every, everybody's got access to this information, uh, which they didn't before. And so that really started people digging into the Bible on their own and doing some reading and uh, uh, began to think for themselves on matters pertaining to religion and theology, whereas before that was kind of funneled through the folks at church who told you what, what was, or, or perhaps um, most effectively, uh, in stained glass pictorials, right, of different biblical scenes. That's, it was a form of teaching people religion. Well, as some of the folks in Poland and Romania uh, were among the people who had 
purchase their Bibles and have them translated into uh, uh, Polish and, and, and in some cases Hungarian, uh, felt that the Bible didn't support what they were hearing uh, from their Catholic churches, or, and even what they were hearing from their Lutheran churches. Uh, and instead, they started to consider themselves subordinationists and started to read things that were very much in line with what Arius had taught. Uh, in some cases, they rejected the idea of the Trinity and instead claimed that God was one, a unity, and that the two other persons of the Trinity were separate, including Jesus, who they believed to be a man. Orthodox Christians were Trinitarian by their belief in the threefold nature of God. These new Christians saw God as one, a unity, and therefore acquired the name Unitarian. So uni Unitarianism, as we call it now, uh, is, is that belief that uh, instead of the three persons of the Trinity, there's uh, one God with Jesus as a, uh, uh, probably a subordinationist sort of position. Um, so these Unitarians in Poland and Transylvania, uh, which was part of both Hungary and, Tran and Romania at various times, uh, began to form churches around this idea. And this is the beginning of what we call the free church tradition. Um, and these, these Unitarians had been excluded by the creeds of the various churches, both Catholic and, and Lutheran. Uh, and, and a creed, of course, is a statement of belief. It, says, it starts off, credo is the Latin word, I believe. Uh, uh, I believe in yada, 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 yada. Uh, and, and these beliefs were really meant to make sure that everyone present in that church were, were sort of on the same page together, right? We're not believing different things. And if you don't believe what we believe, well, <laughs> it depends on the point in history. You either were uh, uh, you know, taken out with, by the Inquisition or you just sort of left. Uh, uh, but the, the creeds were really meant to be, you know, this is who we are as a church. It defined who we are as a church. Um, the, the folks in Poland and Transylvania, they had been sort of the people on the outs. They had been the people who had this idea about the unity of God, sort of the trinity of God. And so they didn't want to start a new church that had the same dynamic. They didn't want to start a church based on creeds or, or statements of belief that everybody's got to believe in this one statement. Uh, what they really wanted was the freedom to celebrate um, and to choose what they believe. Heresy, heretic, um, the root of that uh, means to choose. Uh, so uh, uh, heresy is, comes from our choosing different ideas. Uh, so they rejected creeds, and when these early Unitarians formed a church, they did so not on the basis of a stated belief, but on a mutual, a set of mutual accountability, a relationship. And they called that relationship a covenant. This harkened back to the covenants of the Old Testament, and, and as well as to the early church, or the early Christian churches before the big church was established. That Christianity was in these little pockets in, in the cities around uh, the Mediterranean. And so covenant became the foundation of their church rather than creed. Covenant is a relationship with obligations on both sides that different parties agree to. And this often includes God, too, as sort of a third party to bear witness to this. Marriage is a good example of, of a covenant. So we can, if you think about your marriage or a marriage that you may have seen, uh, people disagree, right? Not everybody in a marriage always agrees on everything. They have different ideas about stuff. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily end the relationship just because we disagree. We, are still in relationship because we've made promises to each other. It's a covenanted kind of, really very different, unique kind of relationship that has a higher level of commitment than just uh, uh, based on belief. And this is really the foundation of Unitarian Universalist churches even today. Uh, and th this is part of the reason why that question, what is it that Unitarian Universalists believe, is a question that's so difficult to answer. We don't create churches based on belief. We, we do it. We do it based on these covenants, these relationships, these promises we make to one another. A better question for a Unitarian Universalist might be, how well are you in relationship? Kind of an interesting question to ask. I'd kind of like to promote that among some Unitarian Universalists. Uh, 
Now, astute listeners may have noticed that up until this time, I've been talking only about Unitarians. What of the second half of our name, the Universalists? Well, at the time of this Reformation that I was talking about, John Calvin uh, became uh, really one of the foremost thinkers of the uh, Reformation movement. Some have said that Unitarian Universalism uh, were it to give uh, its greatest debt to a single individual, it would have to be John Calvin, because so much of our thinking of both the Unitarians and the Universalists were in opposition to him. Uh, Calvin taught the, uh, what he called the salvation by the elect. Uh, uh, superficially, or excuse me, uh, specifically that means that humanity is full of all kinds of people. Uh, and uh, in Calvin's view, all of us are sinners. All of us are sinners, and we're the worst kind of sinners. We are worthy of the torments of hell in, in however ways your imagination can imagine it. The worst scary movie you can think of is still you know, a picnic next to what we all deserve to get in the afterlife, according to Calvin. However, he says, God chooses a few to be righteous, and therefore saves them from this hell and damnation. And instead, this small group of, and that's what he calls them, the elect, are saved by being the true believers of Christ's death and resurrection. Now, I'll admit that there's a lot more to Calvinism than what I just said, and I don't mean to make a straw man out of him uh, here. Uh, it's a lot more complicated and nuanced than what I'm able to do uh, uh, with our time this morning. But I want to just kind of focus a bit on this idea of the elect, that a very few are going to be going to heaven. There were a group of Calvinists in England who started to kind of question this idea a little bit. Uh, why such a small group? Calvin would assert that the elect, even the people who God chooses to go up to heaven, they're still sinners. They're still awful, terrible beings. But uh, God ordained at the beginning of creation to save only them. Why? Isn't that a little bit cruel of God to sort of set us up like that, create all of humanity, make us sinners, uh, and, and then only save a few? Um, and if you read the New Testament, though, you read about Jesus' teachings about how loving God is, about how uh, God's love is infinite, about how forgiving and merciful um, God can be. Surely Jesus can teach us to turn the other cheek, that God must be at least as forgiving of our sins as that. Well, some of these folks in England, as I said, started to teach that God was infinitely forgiving and merciful, and our sins since we're but mere humans, right? God, God's God, we're human. God's infinitely good. We're but mere humans and therefore finite. So even someone like Hitler, as bad as he was, can only produce so much sin as a single living human being in comparison to the infinite love of God. So therefore the elect can't be a small group. Otherwise God's really no better than the bouncer in Studio 54. So it must be that everyone gets to go to heaven. So God's kind of like, I kind of like to think of him as Oprah, right? You go to heaven, and you go to heaven, and you go to heaven, and you go to heaven. So we're all going to heaven. Therefore, uh, as they put it, salvation is universal. Those who believe in universal salvation are called universalists. It's interesting that, you know, kind of everything old is new again. We, we have these ideas in the past and we sort of forget about them, and then someone else discovers them again and they, they sort of feel like they're revolutionary. Uh, just in the past few years uh, in the evangelical Christian community, um, where, you know, you think this is a million miles away from some of this stuff, uh, there have been at least two pretty high profile ministers, uh, Carlton Pearson and Rob Bell, uh, ministers and, and authors now, uh, who've really worked their way toward believing in universal salvation. And, and it was scandalized their churches. Um, uh, Unitarian Universalists have had that idea for uh, uh, something like 400 years now. Um, uh, and uh, it's just interesting to see it, um, just how revolutionary and how, how uh, different it can be in a new context. But the Universalists were not the only ones with the problem of Calvin. 
or his theology. Uh, one of Calvin's favorite beliefs, as I said, uh, it does not originate with him, but it's one that he sort of took to new heights, um, was what is known as the doctrine of original sin. Um, as I say, he didn't invent it, but he crafted it into something truly his own. Uh, and uh, this is a, an idea I'm sure many of you are aware of. It says that uh, since Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, uh, commandment in the Garden of Eden not to eat of the fruit of uh, knowledge of good and evil, all of us are descendants of Adam, and so all of us participate in that disobedient nature, that all of us are, uh, there's, there's some sort of separation between our will and the will of God. Uh, and therefore all of us are sinful, and Again, this is kind of Calvin taking it to the next level. All of us deserving of God's wrath and God's judgment. Um, Calvin, very fond of saying, one of his favorite sayings was that humans are worms five feet long. People were shorter back in his day. You might say six feet, five and a half, something like that now. Uh, but, but that was sort of how human beings were looked upon uh, uh, from the perspective of God. So they just, were just like worms, insects. William Ellerly Channing, who's often called the father of American Unitarianism, was greatly influenced by the Enlightenment, and he uh, objected in a lot of ways to the ideas floating around at the time he was living in New England uh, uh, in the early part of the 19th century, um, so 1800s. Uh, felt that reason had to be a part of religion. This is a something that comes about through the Enlightenment, that reason is an important value, um, and our ability to reason is an important part of who human beings are. Uh, and, and Channing extended this into the realm of religion. If God had not wanted us to use reason, he argued, then why put everything in a book? Don't we have to read a book? Don't we have to figure out what a book says? This implies that we have to read it and understand it, and therefore, we as a human race, must have some redeeming value, right? I mean, we can do some things for ourselves. We're not merely worms five feet long. We've got some value. Um, and while, granted, we may not follow God's will 100% of the time, he felt that he started taking things a little too far uh, uh, to claim that humanity has no redeeming value and that we're all evil. At worst, we're kind of a mixture of good and evil. And perhaps the good could even overcome the evil part of ourselves, if given enough education and training in various virtuous arts and so forth. In many ways, Channing's very close to Plato in, in, in Aristotle and his uh, conception of virtue and education. But notice something very interesting here. Channing's theological objection to Calvin's original sin, that we are inherently good or bad, it had nothing to do with the Trinity, right? It was a discussion about humanity's sinful nature or la the lack thereof. Uh, it was later in a pamphlet, you have to take a step back, remember the printing press is the, the medium here. Uh, I'm sure these guys would have loved the internet, you know, if the, 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 they could flame each other and put things on their Facebook pages, they would have ate this up. But the best they could do was write pamphlets. Uh, talking about how the other guy is an idiot, and he's a jerk, and we don't like him, and he's going to hell, and da, da, da. And so they're, and, and it kind of degenerated into that level of name calling at times. Uh, and of course, not unique to uh, the Unitarians or the Calvinists. This is true of political and theological debates throughout the, the time period. But at the time, there was a, a pamphlet that Channing had wrote, kind of defending this position uh, of, of using reason in religion. Uh, and he brought up the doctrine of the Trinity. And, and essentially uh, uh, said that he believed in subordinationism, uh, much as Arius had. Now the Calvinists uh, in New England read this pamphlet and they thought that they had him. They had him, oh my god, this is the worst, most blasphemous thing you can be to deny the Trinity. And so they called him the worst name they could think of, a Unitarian. Uh, so even though Channing's initial theological objection didn't have anything to do with the Trinity. It was sort of something that came up through the argument. Um, he was accused of this, of being a Unitarian, and, and that was meant to be a slur. Uh, and, and so, in 1817, uh, he preached a sermon, and this is back when people paid attention to sermons. <laughs> uh, he preached a sermon in Baltimore, 
entitled Unitarian Christianity. And it was really, uh, did, a, did a few things in which he stated, kind of summarized a lot of these ideas, uh, and, and it kind of owned the word Unitarian in a way that he hadn't before. Uh, and that's really, Mark, that sermon in 1817 in Baltimore is kind of considered the beginning of Unitarianism in America, officially. Uh, so that's kind of the historical framework from which Unitarian Universalism arrived. We received the name Unitarian because of historically uh, the rejection of the Trinity and the assertion that Jesus was a man rather than a God. We received the name Universalist, again historically, because, because we believe that God is all loving and merciful, that all of humanity will go to heaven. Uh, now, those two ideas taken together probably make Unitarian Universalism unique <laughs> enough, but uh, I want to spend kind of our second half getting away from the history a little bit, because I've probably given you enough of that, uh, and spend sort of the second half talking a little bit more about Unitarian Universalism today, uh, where you see uh, the, the history that we've talked about is how the conversation got started. Right? That's the beginning, that's the origins of it, how it began 300 years ago. But it's been going on those three centuries, and so it's in a very different place. It's evolving, uh, and in many ways is in a very different state now. Few Unitarian Universalists that you meet today would probably talk to you about universal salvation or Jesus as a human being. Uh, they might be aware of such ideas and how they were part of our, our origin and so forth. Um, but ours, you know, is a sort of a future-oriented faith. It's one that we are kind of looking forward a lot of the time. And Unitarians and Universalists, although they both have in common a, a, a critique of Calvinism, uh, they eventually do merge together. Uh, in 1961, uh, the Unitarians and the Universalists become the same thing, what we call the Unitarian Universalist uh, Association. But what are they like today? What makes us unique right now? Well, we still retain a good bit of that New England ancestry. Boston is the home for our, our religion in many ways. Many churches mimic, uh, even in their architecture, a lot of the New England style of things. Uh, our liturgy and worship, very close to Protestant worship services, only uh, usually without the Bible or the cross, um, but very similar in many other regards. We have what's called a congregational form of organizing, so we don't have bishops or uh, uh, councils, but each individual church is its final authority in religious matters. And we have a denomination, what we call an association, uh, which is congregations that are in covenant together, calling back that relationship. Uh, so these are things that, you know, are, are similar to, that we have in common with other religious traditions. But what makes us, what makes Unitarian Universalism unique? I think there's two general ideas that I want to spend the rest of my time talking about today, that they're really uh, are, are ideas that are unique to Unitarian Universalism. Um, the first one we might call the goodness of every person. And the other one we can call the interconnectedness of all that is. So let's start with the goodness of every person. Uh, I've already traced for you a little bit the historical context of this idea as a rebellion of a rebellion of sorts against the doctrine of original sin. You'll recall that Channing's original objection to Calvinism of his day was that, that it was hostile to human reason, at least reason as it's applied to religion. Uh, Channing was ever the student of the Enlightenment and um, didn't like that. He, he, wanted, he said that reason can and should be encouraged as a part of a fully authentic religious life. That, that, how we think about science, how we think about the natural world, um, all that should be grist for the mill, all that should be included in uh, our religious reflection uh, because that's who we are. Today, reason is still impor an important component of Unitarian Universalism, uh, uh, but this means that uh, in some cases, that uh, because we like reason so much, Unitarian Universalists may or may not believe in God, uh, and indeed humanism, uh, as it's known, and it sounds like you've heard a little bit about what humanism is, um, a very popular theological option, uh, particularly in the middle part of the 20th century within Unitarian and Universalism. 
Um, but for me, I think reason is a part of that needing to be personally authentic. It's very important to Unitarian Universalists that we be allowed to bring our full selves to our faith, to our church. And this means that you're, if you're a scientist, you don't have to sort of pretend, pretend to go along with creationism while you're at church and then go back to believing something else that may be more informed by science later on. But that you own that, that, that that's part of what it means, part of your religious understanding. Um, and you don't have to cut that part of yourself off in order to go to church. This, of course, also includes um, you know, our gay, lesbian brothers and sisters who uh, you know, do not have to be in the closet in uh, Unitarian Universalist churches uh, or pretend to be straight or what have you. Um, so, so one thing about the inherent goodness, uh, one way in which it's understood, is that you bring your full self to your religion, words and all. And that includes reason. Another aspect of that inherent goodness, again, that I kind of touched on a little earlier, is freedom. Unitarian Universalists are part of that free church tradition. Uh, and that's still the case, although most Unitarian Universalists probably wouldn't call it that, as I said. But uh, this means that people are choose, they are free to choose. We sort of, we sort of own and, and like that word heretic, um, and like being called heretics, because it implies that sense of choice. Um, so based on reason, as I said, based on their personal experiences, um, based on whatever spiritual journey you may be on, uh, that becomes part of one's religious understanding. What Unitarian Universalists believe remains very much a matter, therefore, of their individual conscience to choose. One of the cardinal sins of our tradition is telling another person what they should believe. Uh, Unitarian Universalism evangelism, such that it is, really consists of me telling you what I believe and you drawing whatever conclusion you want from it from there. So the third part of our inherent goodness uh, kind of comes from the other two, of reason and freedom. And, and the third part is what I'll call religious pluralism. Uh, Unitarian Universalism thrives on diversity. We believe that uh, having a bunch of people who believe different things and expressing those beliefs is a good thing. This too contributes to that difficulty of answering the persistent question, what is it the Unitarian Universalists believe? Well, we value different spiritual practices, such as prayer, Buddhist meditation. Um, at First Unitarian Church, where, where I serve as senior minister, there are members who under, understand themselves to be Christian, very much in line with that traditional universalist idea that everyone's saved. <coughs> Excuse me. There are atheists who object every time I use the word God in a sermon. Um, and uh, uh, I myself am a practicing Zen Buddhist. Uh, there are others who uh, practice a Wiccan and Earth-based religion. Uh, this, morning, this morning I was having a conversation with my assistant minister and we were thinking about some different programs to do with the church and one question came up, is this too weird for our people to do? Uh, and uh, I thought, no, it's not. Let's try it. Uh, so that's, that's sort of a, a question that sometimes comes up for us uh, based on this pluralistic idea. Um, so that's, that, well, those three things, freedom, reason, and, and religious pluralism, kind of make up what we might call uh, our kind of, kind of ideas that Unitarian Universalists have based on our understanding that we're, and each person is good, has some redeeming quality that we're not fully fallen, we're not five worms, five foot long. The other idea uh, that I want to spend the rest, the remainder of my time on is something that we would call the interconnectedness of all that is. Sometimes you uh, may hear Unitarian Universalists speak of the interdependent web of all existence of which we are part. Now, in many ways, it's a common idea throughout many world religions, particularly mystical traditions um, in various world religions. It's a worldview that's gained some scientific validity with the popularity of ecology and how different ecosystems interact with each other in mysterious and perhaps indirect ways. But I think the best way to get a sense of what interconnectedness is about is uh, it comes from the movie uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Everyone, surely we've all seen this film before, right, at Christmas time. Uh, it's a, a holiday classic starring Jimmy Stewart as George Bailey. Uh, and, and though it's touted as a Christmas movie, and I guess, I guess it is sort of Christian, there's, they talk about angels and 
all that sort of thing. Uh, I've always felt it was a much better illustration of Buddhism than of Christianity. George Bailey works his entire life for other people, always thinking of other people first. It's really the bodhisattva ideal in Buddhism. Um, uh, well, and so he's always putting others before himself, his father, his brother, his friends, employers, eventually his wife and his own children. Uh, but one thing he fails to understand is just how pivotal his life has been in bringing about the happiness of all those other folks. And so, on the verge of committing suicide, the angel Clarence comes to George Bailey and does a wonderful thing. He shows him how the world would have been different had George Bailey not been alive. Uh, and so if we're thinking very literally about an interdependent web, maybe like a spider's web, Clarence is proposing that we pull apart or pluck one little strand away just to see what happens. What happens when you pull out one person's life? How is the rest of existence altered? Uh, and, and what are the myriad ways in which that one person's life touched and interacted with the lives of others? Well, as a boy, you may remember, as a boy, George Bailey saved the life of his brother from falling through the ice, and his brother lived. George has a, uh, is deaf in one ear, has significant hearing loss, really for the rest of his life. Uh, and that meant that while everyone else went off, the, this movie came out right at the end of World War II, so uh, World War II is very fresh in its consciousness. And as everyone else went off to World War II, traveled to far off exotic places, led, did, did heroic deeds for others, George Bailey had to stay at home and take care of the home front. His brother uh, in the war stops a kamikaze plane from uh, hitting, destroying the ship and, and saved hundreds of lives as a result and got a medal and was sort of a celebrated war hero. However, uh, with him not having lived, Clarence points out that without George to save his brother from falling through, his ice, through the ice, his brother drowned at a young age. And without a brother there to stop the plane from hitting the, destroying the ship, hundreds of lives are lost in World War II where they had been saved before. And all of those people, the, the, the sailors on the ship, the kamikaze pilot, George's brother, all affected in a very tangible way by George's life. They're all interdependent on one another. Pluck any one of them out from the hole and the whole web is affected. Now I could go on, but the movie demonstrates this point time and again that without George Bailey uh, and his life as a so-called failure, uh, and it, the failure to travel and live sort of the adventurous life that he had dreamed, that the town he loves is ruined, friends, acquaintances, bosses, and so forth. The, the whole town is ruined by the evil Mr. Potter. Now, Unitarian Universalists may argue with each other at times as to whether or not there is a being that we can point to and call God, but I think most Unitarian Universalists would agree that the world we live in and the lives we lead are very similar to George Bailey's. That take any one of you here, pretend you had not existed, and contemplate how the world would be different. In other words, what are the ways in which your life touches all of the other lives that you know? Not merely your children and your grandchildren, who obviously would not exist, but, but what of your siblings, what of your friends, what of the person you pass on the street and smile to? The Greek philosopher Heraclitus says that we cannot step into the same river twice, that the world is, in which we live is always changing, always constantly moving, that the smallest interaction that we have uh, can reverberate in ways that we cannot know. The smallest gesture, a smile, a kind word, or a glance can make a world of a difference to someone else. Just think then about the big things we do, about the big actions we take, how those can affect others as well. So Unitarian Universalists tend not to preach about the afterlife as much as our Universalist ancestors used to, but at every time I do a funeral, I remind people of how we connect to each other, how we change each other, and that it can be for good and it can be for ill. Unitarian Universalism encourages us to live a life that's mindful of those interconnections. Native Americans have a tradition of making decisions 
Uh, and as part of their decision-making process, they asked themselves, how would this affect our tribe down to the next seven generations? That's living according to this interdependent web of existence. The idea that we are all connected to each other and forms uh, a good deal of the work that Unitarian Universalists do around social action and social justice efforts. I'll spare you a litany of all the wonderful things that Unitarian Universalists have done in the past around abolition and gay marriage and immigration issues and the environment and more locally some things we do around uh, young adults aging out of foster care. I'm sure other religions um, could be rightly proud of similar accomplishments. And I'd also almost feel the need to confess ways in which we've failed to live out our, our connection to the interdependent web. No one's perfect. But becoming aware of how connected we are to each other is a fundamental part of that spiritual journey um, that is Unitarian Universalism. We place an emphasis on that personal authenticity that if you really have had an experience of connection in your life, then of course you need to live it out in a practical sense. And that's where um, you'll see a lot of Unitarian Universalists and, and churches, as well as individuals, doing different social justice efforts, and that's really a, 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 an important part of how we practice our faith. And, it's a, and that interconnection is also a bedrock of our churches. you recall that I mentioned that the early Unitarians founded churches based not on the beliefs or creeds, but are founded on uh, the Old Testament idea of covenant. Um, the church in Unitarian Universalism is a covenanted community, is the embodiment of all those interconnections that we have with each other. Uh, it's, it's our way of living them out in an intentional way. I believe, personally, uh, that it's impossible to be a Unitarian Universalist all by yourself. That if we were to truly live in accordance with a worldview that understands that my life changes your life and your life changes mine, then we can only practice a religion within the context of a relationship. A covenant's a, a relationship in which I make those promises to you, you make those promises to me. We promise to walk together, to share our ideas together as spiritual beings. And I believe that each person's life story has something to teach me. When, when someone reflects on their story and I share something about my story and we listen, we truly listen, we can gain insights into how we live. And that's, that's, again, another important way in which we practice this interconnection, living out that covenant, um, uh, is to form small groups in which these stories get told, in which we listen to the stories of others. Very popular in a lot of churches, um, particularly, again, kind of comes from evangelical tradition, but it fits in very nicely with Unitarian Universalist ideas of interconnection and understanding of the covenant. So to have a small group of people that I share my life with uh, and that they do the same for me and that it's safe and that we can be vulnerable uh, with each other and that we can form some real connections with each other not just sort of superficial polite stuff that's re really getting at I think the heart of what religion is meant to be all about I believe most people in the world today really are hungry for a real connection with another human being um, that there's that, that there's a real reason why the internet really social media uh, in particular has taken off so much in the past few years is that we feel this hunger for real connection but I don't know that we find it so much through our computers or through our cell phones. Uh, now I may be wrong, maybe the newest generation uh, can be sustained by cyber relationships but something in me doubts that that would last. That we need to truly connect with each other including not just uh, the stuff we like to show off about ourselves with each other. I can tell you about my doctorate that I got from the University of Chicago and brag about um, my family or my kids or whatnot. But how much of that do you really learn about me? How much do you really learn about me when I tell you what scares me? What, uh, uh, where, where I'm um, afraid, where, where I suffer? It's that pain and suffering that actually brings us closer we really empathize and understand somebody at that level. But it needs to be safe, right? It needs to be contained. And I think that's uh, uh, something that Unitarian Universalism tries to do in living out those interconnections. 
Um, so that, that hunger uh, for connection is deeply ingrained into our culture and in our society. Uh, and I, I, I believe that uh, that's really what Unitarian Universalism is called to do right now, is to help people connect in meaningful ways. Whether that connection may be to something one calls God or nature or Buddha or goddess, the, the name is fine. But we truly see God, not through the lens of a telescope uh, peering out into space, but we see it in the faces and the smiles of one another. Uh, when we've done the spiritual work of connecting, a Zen master where he or she hear my laugh and say, and, and remind us that we are all Buddhas. We are. And so those are really the two big ideas, the two main things I want to talk, uh, mention to you about Unitarian Universalism, what makes us unique, that uh, all people are good, and that we're all connected to each other. One sort of uh, uh, pushes us to value the individual, the other pushes us to value the community. I think both are necessary for a healthy religion. In conclusion, I just want to thank you all for your good attention, and to thank Joe again for the invitation to speak here this afternoon. It's truly been my pleasure, and I'd like to spend the rest of the time answering your questions. Thank you. Who's got the first one? Right back here. Two of the We're the people who I paid to ask me easy questions. <laughs> I'm not sure this is an easy one. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm listening because I've been growing in my, my beliefs for what, probably 20 years I've been looking. And I'm wondering, I, I can relate to what you're saying, but where do you start for a child? How do you ah. teach them? Yes, excellent question. Um, right. So uh, uh, we call it religious education in our class, just to give you a, a little bit of our nomenclature. Um, we tend to shy away from the term Sunday school, but essentially that's, that's what we do. Uh, uh, and so in, in our churches we do um, religious education. Um, uh, those of you who maybe... <laughs> so those